Hello, my name is Anne Wong and I'm a teaching artist with the Houston Center for Photography. Today is the second workshop of our Levy Park Photography Workshops that run from May 2020 until April 2021. Usually we meet at Levy Park every first and third Saturday of the month from 9 to 11 a.m. Currently our workshops are being held online. Uh, today I'm going to cover composition and focusing basics. And I hope that you will join me Saturday morning for a live Q&A on Zoom that will happen from 9 to 10 a.m. Thank you very much and see you Saturday. As I was mentioning before, the topic for today is composition and focusing basics. I will start the presentation with an overview of focusing techniques. Then we will talk about composition, which is about seeing, arranging, creating, framing. We will learn how to guide the eye of the viewer and arrange the visual elements to create a well-balanced image. My goal for today's presentation is to help you create well-balanced images that are appealing and powerful. I would like to help you create images that tell a visual story. Focusing basics. Um, the camera focusing tools were covered in the previous workshop two weeks ago that was called Getting to Know Your Camera. Um, if you were not able to attend this workshop, um, please refer to your camera manual to know exactly where the focusing tools are. Here I will cover the steps to achieving better focus and sharpness in your images. So the number one step for focusing is to be precise with your focus. You really need to understand how to properly focus your camera to get crystal clear and sharp photographs. You can select the point of focus only in the creative mode. That means program, aperture priority, shutter, shutter speed, and fully manual. You have to select your point of focus to focus only on one spot. So if you look at the image that we have in front of us, which is a beautiful portrait, you'll see that the focusing point, which is highlighted in red, is on the eye of the subject. We do not have all the points that are highlighted. Really, especially for a close-up portrait like this, the face is too much of a large area to focus on. You really have to focus on a very specific part of the image. And for such a close-up portrait, the best um, focusing point is to focus on the eye of the subject. If the spot in your subject where you want to focus does not have a focus point available, you will have to use the focusing and recomposing technique that we covered in uh, getting to know your camera. So the step number two in focusing is to select the right focusing mode. Usually in cameras, you will have two types of focusing mode. One shoot on Canon is called AFS on Nikon, and that's the focusing mode for still subjects. AI Servo on Canon or AFC on Nikon is the focusing mode for moving subjects. There is an additional focusing mode in Canon which it, that switches automatically between one shot and AI Servo, that sounds really like a wonderful option, but it's not recommended because it is not very accurate. The third step is to have the right depth of field. What is the depth of field? Well, the depth of field is the area of sharpness from near to far in, a, in an image. It is function of aperture, focal lens, and the distance between the subject and the lens. And I'm going to this in more detail in this slide. So a small depth of field, you can see it on the image of the bird that is at the top. Only one bird is in focus. And as the depth of field increases, you have three birds in focus and then you have all seven birds in focus and the tree. That's a large depth of field. The shallow depth of field that we have on top is mostly used for portraits, for example. 
the large depth of field that we have at the bottom is used for landscapes. So what does Aperture do with the depth of field? If you look at the top, my aperture is 1.4, which is a large aperture, a wide opening in my lens, and that gives me a very shallow depth of field. As my aperture decreases and I go to f22 and I have a small opening, my depth of field increases and I have more birds into focus. Our next thing is the focusing distance. That's the distance between uh, the lens and your subject. The closer I am to my subject, the smaller will be my depth of field. The further away I am from my subject, the larger will be my depth of field. Okay. The other thing is um, um, uh, the focal lens, sorry. With a shorter focal lens, like for example 24 millimeter in our image, I have a bigger depth of field possible. And as I have a longer focal lens, like 200 millimeter, I have a shorter depth of um, a shorter depth of field available. In order, I'd like to talk a little bit about the focal lens. The focal lens is really the angle of view that you are going to have. How much of the scene is captured? You see at 24 millimeter, I'm capturing my bird and the full tree. However, as I go to 200 millimeter, I have a magnification factor. It's how large the uh, subject is now going to appear. And the angle is narrower and if you see there now I'm not viewing my bird and the tree anymore but really the chest of the bird only. This is what the focal lens does um, for you. So now let's move uh, to composition. Beauty can be seen in all things. Seeing and composing the beauty is what separates the snapshot from the photograph. So what I'd like to you to do today is really take you away from the snapshot and try practicing photography. Every time you look through the viewfinder and frame a scene, you are going to be making a decision on composing your photo. Seeing, arranging, creating and framing. So orientation. You can take uh, an image in the landscape format. Uh, landscape images often feel more natural to look at because they mimic the way that our eyes see the world. They also allow you to fit more elements into your image, so they provide an easier format for storytelling. Um, by shooting landscape, you can also give more of a sense of place. A vertical format can be beneficial when you want to get in closer and focus on a single subject or a tight area. It's actually an easy way to simplify your photo and get rid of any elements that might take attention away from your main subject. So I really do recommend that you shoot both. When you pick a subject, try shooting your subject both landscape and portrait. Landscape images have more of a calming effect, while images in a portrait format are more dynamic. So try both and see which format you prefer. So when you are creating a horizontal or a landscape or a portrait image, you want to make sure that your lines are straight. If they are slightly off, the image is not going to feel balanced to the viewer. However, someone you might want to skew your subject at an angle, but you have to purposely do that. And this will add more interest and energy to the photo. Like we, we can see that in the example of the Eiffel Tower on the right hand side. So here we have a classic vertical shot of the Eiffel Tower versus a more energetic and skewed shot of the Eiffel Tower.
Filling the frame is a very important concept. You really have to figure out what is significant in the frame, get close and capture only that. Make sure that everything you include in the frame makes sense for the story you have to tell. Cut everything else that can be a distraction or that doesn't support the main subject. What I tell my students is really look in the viewfinder and work your way in from the four corners to the center of your image and scan your image for distractions and really reframe, move, recompose until you have the perfect image. So here we have two examples of portraits, one close-up portrait where we have only the face and the ex expression of the person on the top left image. On the bottom right, it's more an, um, an environmental portrait that includes the window shop. And that's really a strong supporting element to the narrative of the image. And it really supports the person that we have posing in this image. Filling the frame um, in an obvious way sometimes is the best way to remove unwanted clutter. Like in the top right image of the flower, it can remove any twigs and other plants that are distracting and that were around this beautiful flower. And it places greater emphasis on the flower. On the bottom right, we have a wonderful child, but if his eyes were the most interesting in his face on that day because of the reflection, in his eyes, then capture only the eyes. This is also a great ex example of filling the frame, but um, we, I'm using this photograph here to talk about viewpoint. Viewpoint is the position from which you are looking at the composition, and it can have a very big impact on your image and affect the, mes the message that you are trying to convey and the storytelling aspect of your image. And really, do not photograph the world the way a person sees it every day. You have to surprise your viewer. Take your image from high above, above, low to the ground, from the side. Try very different angles. Be creative. So the perspective really uh, can drastically impact the way the image looks, but also impact the story of the image. So as you take more workshops with me, you'll notice that I focus a lot on storytelling, whether it is a single image or a series of image. I really would like you not to take a snapshot, but a photograph and tell me a story. So this image here obviously is taken for a drone and shooting from a high camera angle can make everything feel smaller and diminished in power. And we really, when you really go to extreme in height, it can take on an abstract and graphic feeling, which we can see in this image. I really like this famous shot from Elwood, Elliot Irwitt on the bottom left. So these two shots are taken from low to the ground. If you want to emphasize the height and power of a scene, you can get low to the ground and tilt the camera slightly up. People will look more important and prominent. But uh, here, Elliot Erwitt really shot it straight. And I think uh, um, this image has a tremendous impact and the storytelling is very powerful. I was telling you not to photograph at eye level, but eye level can be sometimes interesting. And here I think the interest is due to the bold color, um, the aesthetic of the chair and, and the texture of the wall. So you have a um, different example of viewpoints in these four images. Depths. Depth is very important because photography is a two-dimensional medium and we have to choose our composition carefully to convey the sense of depth that was present in the actual scene when we were taking the image. You can create uh, depth in a photograph by including elements in the foreground, in the middle ground, and in the background. Here, 
the foreground, middle ground, and background helps our eye to move through the image and take us to our subject in the background, which is the lighthouse. You can create depths in all kinds of different ways. Um, for example, you can create depths with leading lines. You can create depths also with selective focus. You see here the background is blur. You can uh, create depths by with the use of light. The light is falling on my subject while the background is in the shade. All these are ways to add depths, as well as repetition, viewpoint. So think about this when you frame your images. Background. Background is also very important. You can choose to isolate your subject from its background and foreground by using a shallow depth of field. We talked about this earlier on. Or you can choose to put the same subject in context by revealing its surroundings with a large depth of field. Like in this image by Henri Cartier-Bresson. I really like this image of Monet in he's in the privacy of his house and I really love the birds and the cages in the foreground and the background and in the middle we have Monet sitting and holding a bird in his hands. I think it's a great environmental portrait. Scale has to do with the size of objects in a composition and here we can see the immensity of the desert with this person walking in and the long shadow being his companion. Use objects of known size so that the viewer can make a connection between them and the surroundings and he can understand and he can get really a sense of scale. And as a result, the image tells more of the story and has more impact. These are all the things that you will have to take into consideration as you are looking at your scene and subject and then through your viewfinder. I'm talking about whether you're going to shoot landscape or portrait, filling the frame, your choice of viewpoint, how are you going to create depths, what is going to be your background, and do you need to give a sense of scale? So you will have to take all this into consideration. A very famous quote from Ansel Adams, you don't take a photograph, you make it. Yes, composition is the art of planning or arranging the visual elements within the photograph for a deliberate effect. So now we're going to look at different ways of arranging these visual elements. The first one is the rule of third. So positioning the subject or important elements in the image, such as the horizon or your subject, you know, in the middle of the frame can make the image look a bit too static. And the best way around this is to use the rule of third. What is the rule of third? Well, you divide your frame into nine equal segments by drawing two vertical lines and two horizontal lines. Some cameras have this option now and you can overlay this grid on the viewing screen. And so what you'll be doing, you are going to position um, the most important elements in your scene along these lines. So for example, here we have our lighthouse on the, on the rule of third on the right hand side. Then we have the horizon line that is on the bottom third. Why is it on the bottom third? Well, I think it's because the foreground here is not very interesting. It's snow and grass, while the sky is very interesting with the light, the sunset and the movement of the clouds. So that's why we've chosen to see to show two-thirds of the sky. The rule of third is going to help create harmony and balance. It's going to add more complexity to an image than just placing your subject in the center. It creates energy and it gives your photo a sense of depth 
rather than just being a flat image. What you can do also, you can place the subject where the rule of third intersect. So for example, here we have our starfish where they crossed at the bottom left. And if you notice, we've talked about skewed lines before. My horizon here is slightly skewed and it gives a sense of energy. It adds interest and gives energy to the image. And uh, if you want to talk about focusing point, your focusing point here would have to be on your starfish right there. So now let's talk about symmetry. Symmetry is really the easiest way to achieve a balanced image because it guarantees balance from left to right and top to bottom. The result looks formal, organized and orderly. So a symmetrical shot um, can be a little bit predictable and so it's really important I think to have a strong point of interest to make it interesting. So here our line of symmetry is the vertical white line. We have a nice point of interest in the door that has a lot of texture. But there is also two small details that have a strong color. The red flower in the window frame and the red bucket with the rag on the bottom right of the image. These really add uh, tension in the image and make it more interesting by uh, breaking the symmetrical aspect. Since that contain reflections are also a great opportunity to use symmetry in your composition, this image mixes the rule of third and symmetry to compose the scene and that makes it really interesting. The tree is positioned off-center on the right of the frame, but there is the perfectly still water of the lake that provides the symmetry. As, and the landscape format here has a very calming effect. A very important um, element of composition is the leading lines. Leading lines are in a composition are what draws the viewer into the photograph. They can really help create a journey through the image because our eyes are naturally drawn to following lines. And you really have to think about how you place the lines in your image and how your people will view your image when they follow these lines. And you are really taking them into a journey through the scene. It's really like having an arrow in your image saying, hey, look this way. So you see here we have the blue arrow that follows the staircase. We have the red arrows that follow the handrail, the yellow arrow that follow the curb of the road. And Henri Cartier-Bresson in this image might have waited until the bicycle entered these gorgeous frames with all these leading lines and he pressed the shutter at the right moment when the cyclist was in the right spot. That's a beautiful image by Henri Cartier-Bresson. So leading lines can be used to create powerful images with a very strong visual impact. And they are taking us to the main subject. Like on the right hand side, our main subject is the windmill and the leading lines are the tulips and their color is red. And red is a very powerful color, which makes these leading lines even stronger. On the right hand side, they take us to the plane. The leading lines can really take very different type. They can be straight, diagonal, curved, radial, and they are always used to enhance your image composition. And there is a lots of ways uh, to use, uh, you know, you can use trees, buildings, roads, and they are also an excellent way of creating depth and symmetry. Framing. Framing is when surrounding elements are used to enclose certain objects to create a visual frame and enhance the focus, leading the viewer's eyes straight to the place where you want it to go. And doorways and windows are usually um, a simple ways to incorporate a frame in a photograph. 
I really like this image of um, American artist Lee Friedlander because he used a window in a very original way to frame his subject. He is not using the window itself, but the light and shadow from the window to highlight his subject. So I really like this. It's kind of different. So we're going to see um, different framing images. You can use a frame to give a context. For example, here um, it's the Great Wall of China. And notice how the depth of field is very large. My frame is in focus and the entire landscape is in focus. Here um, it's used to give a sense of depth to the image. We have the flowers in the foreground, the gazebo in the middle ground, and in the background we have the red and green trees. It can be an obvious way to lead the eyes of the viewer towards the main focal point. Like here, it's leading us to the bicycle. And then there is more complex framing, like in this picture where you want to intrigue the viewer. I really like this image where we have the woman reflection in a mirror, but she's surrounded from all these um, lines around her that are, that are also reflected in the mirror. This is a beautiful image by Charlie Kirk. Patterns. Humans are being, humans beings are naturally attracted to patterns because they are visually attractive and they suggest harmony. And I think um, the artist Bertrand image in front of us really reflects that. We are surrounded by symmetry and patterns, both natural and man-made, and they they can make a very eye-catching composition. And um, another great way to use them is to break the symmetry of the pattern in some way by introducing tension or a focal point to the scene. And in, our, in this image, Artus Bertrand did that by um, including the green island in the center, which is uh, breaking the pattern of the fields around and adding interest to the image. Here we have two very different examples of patterns. One very bold and colorful, very geometric, and the one at the bottom, a black and white, a vertical symmetry with a shallow depth of field. Here we have um, two symmetry and patterns. Um, and by adding a strong focal point to the photograph, with the monkey in the, and with the tree, it really creates um, tension and interest in the photograph. I really like that. I think that it's very important uh, to break symmetrical images and pattern with something. It, it really does add tremendous interest to the image. Texture like color really can draw people into a photograph and create visual interest. Um, it adds visual weight to the items in the photograph, like you can see there in this gorgeous elephant, and a sense of touch. I think it's very important to use side light in order not, in order not to lose the depth of the texture. two examples of texture. In the bottom portrait, I really love the contrast between the texture of the wall and her smooth face. I think it's just beautiful. And um, here with texture, images can really become alive and almost three-dimensional. We can see that especially in the bottom right image, which is a landscape. So this was the last image of our presentation. So I'd like now to move to the um, hands-on exercise. So first exercise, oops, 
Yeah, our first exercise, I want you to pick one subject and shoot 10 images of that same subject. I want you to surprise the viewer, show us the world in a totally new way. I want you to find a subject that inspires you. Anything works, really. Like, you know, on this example, it's a teddy bear. Take 10 photographs of this same subject, and no two photographs should be alike. And I want to, you to try to shoot both portrait and landscape with the subject off-center, in the center. Try the different compositions we talked about and the elements of design, like lines, color, form, pattern, texture. And when you, when you are done shooting, I really want you to look at your images and pick the best ones. And look at the ones you've picked. Why do you think that they are good? What do you think you did right and that you would like to repeat? And then I would like you to do that exercise again with a different subject. And again, look at your images and understand why they are good and what it is that you want to repeat. And also you might see a style emerging. Maybe you are attracted to photograph lines or you are more attracted to texture. You are more attracted to uh, pattern than texture. So these will be emerging as you practice. The second exercise, usually I would tell you to explore Levy Park, but due to the circumstances, I will tell you to uh, explore your surroundings at home or near your home and make images illustrating the following. Rule of thirds, subject in the center, symmetry, leading lines, framing, pattern, texture, and again, shoot both landscape and portrait, and do not forget to fill the frame with what is important. You know, think about what is your subject and what is the story you are trying to tell. And do not forget to try different viewpoints for the same subject. So you can share the images from these exercise by tagging Levy Park at hashtag Levy Park and, H and the Houston Center for Photography at hashtag HCP online. Um, you can also uh, follow us. You can follow Levy Park at Levy Park Houston, the Houston Center for Photography at HCP online. And you can also follow me at Anne Wong. I usually post the workshops that I teach with the Houston Center for Photography.